good good day to you. Good evening, actually. My name's Thomas Keegan. Today is Thursday, and it is um, June the 28th, uh, 2012, right before the um, uh, Fourth of July weekend uh, next week. Uh, I'm with Libertarian Progressive. Uh, our goal is to uh, interview as many independents and third-party candidates this year as possible before 2012 and to see a wave of new uh, elected officials come in and uh, that's the way to get the attention of the media and and, sub, and, and to influence legislation. Now today I have uh, Jack Rooney who's um, uh, running for US Senate in Indiana as an independent um, and uh, you can visit the website jackrooney.net so I'd like to start out, um, and Jack, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, with um, what what drives you? Like with just a little bit of background, just kind of an introduction. Um, you know, what keeps you up late at night? What gets you up early in the morning, per se? Right. Yeah, Thomas. Thank you for having me on the show, and thank you for putting the show on in general. It's a great thing that you're doing, bringing uh, independent and third-party issues to the people. Um, what drives me, basically, I was, I'm not a politician. I've never held political office, never had any interest in it up until a few years ago when I started seeing some of the choices that were being handed to me by the two-party system. And none of those candidates were acceptable to me here in Indiana in the uh, 2010 election. Yeah, I've seen those so choices, I, Jack. I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, and... So I was looking around to find someone that I could vote for, and I couldn't find anybody. And then I started saying, well, you know, somebody's got to run. And then I started seeing my own hypocrisy. You just sit around and say, well, somebody's got to do something about this. Somebody's got to do something. <laughs> and, you know, it just continues if you fail to do anything. So I saw it as a, a, a situation where I got into where I, I had no choice. So I filed a run in 2010 as a write-in and as an independent, which gave me an opportunity to at least get up and stand up and tell the two major parties what I thought were some of the problems. And uh, got a lot of, of course, I didn't win the election because I just didn't have the kind of funding that they did. And, and writing candidates is a very hard thing to do, uh, being a write-in here in Indiana when they have a two-party system that the ballot is controlled by the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, you do it more than oh, it's like a cartel. It's they have a yeah. cartel over the system. Exactly, and you know, a, a duopoly is what I call it. I think you mentioned that on your website too. Mm -hmm. That it's a duopoly, a monopoly of two. It's still a monopoly, no matter how you cut it. And uh, you know, monopolies are are, are illegal. <laughs> they have been all along. The Sherman Antitrust Act says that you know, no one shall start monopolies or attempt to start them. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're trying to start a monopoly over government, over your government, so that they can get their way. Yeah, it's a, in the United States, basically, is what they're after. Well, Jesse Ventura just wrote a book called The Bloods and the Crips. It kind of... Right, kinda yeah, I saw his... Uh, but yeah, he made a statement a couple... And he basically... We did a thing called uh, Two-Party America. Uh, it's on our website, actually, and it was just basically a, about a 30-minute lecture on the development of the two-party system in the United States, how it arose out of the Civil War, basically. It was an attempt to, in the South, the Democrats were, South people were calling themselves Democrats, and Northerns were calling themselves Republicans, Lincoln stuff. Oh, yeah, Abraham Republican Lincoln, Party. that's right. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, so that schism was uh, developed out of the Civil War. And after the war, after Lee surrendered, it didn't really end there. I mean, the animosity between the Democrats and Republicans, because he had people, the main issue at the time was, you know, they were going to let the South back into government, and he had a lot of people who had a lot of problems with that, and they reached compromise, and they never did get along after that, and that was the division that occurred in the House, where you know, the Democrats sitting on one side and the Republicans sitting on the other, so that division exists to this day. Even yeah, though the Civil War is over 150 years old, the structure of it uh, is still with us. I mean, it's healed up a little bit, but I, I guess I understand what you're saying. I can almost see it just transferring from DNA to DNA, you know, after each new right. birth. It's just there. But, uh, well, what, so, you know, you can ignore politics, but politics um, won't ignore you. And um, right. so you're not ignoring politics. And um, No, if you don't control your government, it will definitely control you. 
you know. So that's why I just decided to go ahead and start running as an independent for the United States Senate. Because they're, why am I doing it for the United States Senate? It's because they deal with international treaties and economic issues and major issues that are areas where I have expertise. Uh, I was a philosophy major, economics and business. So there are things that I know about, and I'm sure I could do just as good a job as anybody that's in there. Uh, right now. Sure. Yeah. Now, we just lost um, Dick Luger. His own party is split, fragmented, and my opponents will be the Democrats and Republicans, but we'll just have to see. So we're getting a lot of support, but the thing is is that the Republicans have split themselves in two here in Indiana, and you have people who are strong Luger supporters who are now looking around for someone to vote for, and even though I'm not really a, a right winger, <laughs> uh, neither was Luger, but I'm not uh, a hardcore Republican, never have been, but I'm not a hardcore socialist either, or, or progressive or anything like right, that. Right, you don't really fit, I, like, I mean, if we, someone looked at your issues, they wouldn't, they'd be like, am I looking at a Democrat website or a Republican website here, you know? I mean, it, right. it's kind of refreshing. To, to, to not see the same old pandering issues that haven't that they rehash every election cycle for the last I mean I remember seeing a Nix uh, like I wasn't alive then but I've seen on YouTube the Nixon and the Kennedy debates they're talking about the exact same stuff they're talking about now exactly nothing's changed well that's why independent candidates who can come in with a, a clear eye and, and and if you're not in the hip pocket of the giant corporations who and the banks the international banks who are controlling the Republicans and Democrats and you come in as an independent, and we can talk about issues that they cannot address because they're issues about them. They're issues about themselves. So they will never address those issues. They have to be addressed by someone from outside. Well, how about this? You say you have an economics um, de degree, right? It's philosophy, actually. But you see, Adam Smith, and uh, you, 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 those are all philosophers, and they start there. Economics, all for modern philosophy, starts with Adam Smith, basically and in the wealth of nations. Oh, yeah. Adam and, Smith you know, is everything, great. Yeah. And so you need to understand, if you understand that, the supply and demand economics of Smith, and, and no one has ever really contradicted what Smith was saying, they've developed it further, uh, the monetist policies and things well, like I've that. Well, I've heard the left and the right quote Adam Smith, like they both want oh, to sure. claim him. Right, because he's basically where it starts, or in modern, in modern philosophy. But that's what philosophy does. And it, I mean, it's the mother of all knowledge. That's mm -hmm. what philosophy is. And usually all of your sciences, your branches of science, stem in one way or another from philosophical thinking. Well, what, like if we had a sen Senate of, uh, let's, say, um, let's say, 50 or let's say 60 independents and third parties who are able to discuss things, disagree on some things, but they all liked Adam Smith, what would we, what would we be doing um, now or maybe um, six or 12 years from now once we uh, decide to, y y you know, have some common sense? What should well, we, what we kind of legislation? Well, we more than we make, that's for sure. We can't continue deficit spending forever, and we have very serious systemic problems within government that need to be addressed that are not being addressed that go back to 1913. To the the Federal Reserve, Federal is that what you're going to say? Yeah, I was sure. just going to ask you, like, um, do you think any of that has to do with the Federal Reserve at all? Absolutely. And, you know, it should not be that way. A nation the size of the United States does not need to borrow money from anyone. We have enough wealth, natural wealth, from sea to shining sea, and our natural resources and assets I mean, yes, we wouldn't, we like, get a privatized military, would we? Um, so, I mean, no one argues, no matter how far libertarian you are, except maybe a few, but hardly anyone argues that, you know, the military should be private. And, and wouldn't money be, like, just as important as the military? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yes, it can be a weapon. <laughs> it can be, and it is, I mean, in some way. By creating a cycle of endless debt from the borrowing of money, uh, we've gotten ourselves into this situation now. On uh, my website, there's a uh, essay, it's an excellent day, a paper that I wrote, uh, Consideration of Constitutional Money, and your listeners might want to take a look at that. But basically, it started when we took ourselves off the gold standard. No, you mean after Bretton Woods? You mean what Nixon did in the 70s? Is yes, that sir. what you mean, uh -huh. or you mean That's before right. that even? Well, it was, it was more, it goes back further. But, you know, they had, we were never supposed to be on, we never were on a gold standard as such. 
So we've always been on the silver standard. The Constitution says that the currency of the United States must be backed by gold or silver. I mean, and in the 50s and 60s weren't too bad, were they, with that gold standard? No, they weren't. And issues that you like to discuss, for example, Social Security, uh, people say, well, what are we do about Social Security? Social Security would be fine because you got to figure your dad was putting, and my dad, were putting silver dollars into that Social Security trust fund. And what happened is they embezzled all the money. They created this fiat currency system and then took us off the silver standard, took all the silver out of the, out of the uh, they, trust fund and replaced it with fiat dollars. Well, they left they us with no IOU. standard. Yeah, in other words, they took all the standards right. out of it. Well, if you notice, the, uh, an, uh, the dollar was defined by the original Congress of the United States when it was set up as equal to one troy ounce of silver. Right, they well, had one an exact amount. Yep. Right, one troy ounce of silver is equal to $24 roughly today. I don't know what the going rate is off the top of my head for this afternoon, but... Mm -hmm. They printed it out 24 times. If you had that much money in purchasing power in the Social Security Fund today, it would be silent out into the, the next 500 now, years. Right. I'll be honest. When a lot of people here talk about gold and silver, like it kind of goes over their head. Like, why is it important that we have like um, you, you know money that's backed with um, some kind of precious metal like silver or gold? Well, it should be only one. We even make a mistake mixing copper and nickel in with it, which we did for a long time, but they were common uh, metals used by the colonists originally, copper especially, so the copper coin had a real value. They made a lot of pots and pans and tea kettles and things out of it, so it had a utilitarian value. But the main reason is you can't print more silver. You can't print more gold. It has to be, you know, it is what it is, and the, the reason that it was there in the Constitution was to prevent government from doing exactly what it's doing today, which yeah, is just printing like, as much money, yeah. which waters down the value of all the money you already have saved up in your bank account. If you look Every at the time, charts from the 70s to now, I mean, it's just been a steady decline in standard it, of living. That's what inflation is. Inflation is not the increase in the price of gas at the pump. They say the price of gas increased today. Well, that's not really what happened. What happened is that the dollar fell in relation to a gallon of gas. A gallon of gas is a is a, a certain BTU standard. I mean, it's based on BTUs. How many British thermal units will a gallon of gas generate? And it doesn't change. So it's fixed. And we probably and, pay less for gas if we didn't go to war for it. Like, I mean, I imagine the market probably could... You know, I mean, it's like you would have Iran and Iraq and all of them. They would be competing against each other to sell us oil at the lowest price, right. wouldn't they? Exactly. But what's changing is not the value of gas. Its value is fixed in British thermal units. What's changing is the currency that it takes to buy that gas. And OPEC and the other nations are not stupid. They see us print money and dump print dollar, fiat dollar bills and dump them into the market. And they say, well, we know what you're doing, so we want more. You've just watered down the value of your currency, so that means your currency is worth less today. We want more of your currency than today than we wanted yesterday. And that's why the price of gas rises. It hasn't had anything to do, well, it's a little bit to do with supply and demand, obviously, but the major cost in the increase, because, I mean, just a few years ago, we were at 75 cents a gallon. Now we're up to $3 and $4 a gallon. Well, I think we might need what to also it? consider, isn't, I think I read in the news recently, like Mexico is thinking about, you know, having a silver standard themselves. Right, right. They, the peso was originally a silver coin, uh, and, and it was for a long time. And I hope they do it, because that would be a good thing, you know. So um, that, that would help get their economy better, and, you know, and we'd probably sell more equipment there. Um, so so basically, honest money has a big deal to do with it. Um, yeah. and, um, exactly. And also, it, it, there's no oversight. So like a lot of these banks, I mean, like we hear that we bail them out, but um, it, it's not like we're really just giving them money, but we are. We're giving them money a, at such a low interest rate, and then what they do is just buy a bunch of treasury bills that pay back just a slightly higher interest rate, but it's in such big amounts that they that's enough to make them solvent again or something like that. Is that exactly? Yeah. yeah. No, it's. It's very troubling. The whole structure of the Federal Reserve System and the American banking system, and the worldwide banking system, worldwide, because this is not just in America. This is 
you know, worldwide problem. Yeah. Now, part of the problem they have to deal with, which is where Senate would come in, uh, international treaties with nations, is the problem is that if we don't have a bank of, uh, of that has the, you know, the, the lender of last resort that can make the kind of loans to people, then the Bank of China will do it. You know what I'm saying? But even China, their currency system is uh, backed by silver, or actually it's a copper coin. But they have, their currency system is not fiat. That's the reason that you, there's no forex, for example, uh, that works with Chinese money. You know what the forex system is? Yes. But, um, is that, isn't that where you trade, like, foreign, um, yeah, you trade currencies? currencies. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what, the reason China isn't in there is because it's a metal system, and they're still backed by copper and silver. So that's the reason why, and they've been trying for years to get them to switch to a fiat system, and China has refused. So, so that's not, one thing that you would champion is auditing the Fed, reining in control of the spending, uh, setting um, a standard, um, like a silver standard, which... I think would be a um, honest thing to do. I mean, it, it's proven itself to work in the 50s and 60s, right? So, right. Um, and uh, well, yeah. the main thing that I would like to do, or like I would like to see, you really don't need a federal. You need a central bank, but it doesn't have to be under control of the international bankers that are controlling it now, which is J.P. Morgan, Deutsche Bank, a lot of these international banks who are the principal shareholders of the Federal Reserve, which is really a private corporation. Um, set up to do that. It's basically a contract. There's nothing federal about it, and there are no reserves. It's all based on a currency. So stuff. do you think it should be by the debt. states, or, um, or or do you think the federal government should print money, like through the Treasury Department instead? Yes, exactly, as the Constitution requires. There's no federal reserve in the Constitution. Of course, that's what the, uh, the, uh, the 13th Amendment, I guess, was. Uh, to allow that, but that was pushed through under rather... Is that why it's an unlucky number? Or? My friend uh, G. Edward Griffin talks about that in his book, uh, Preacher from Jekyll Island. If you want to really know how that thing came about, probably take a look at that. But not Yeah, that seemed stuff. like a lot of market manipulation, like, um, you know, buying stuff on the way, in, on the inflationary way up, and then um, selling and then causing the, uh, the you, you know, the... Um, I guess deflation, and um, and then the, the the victors left over are able to just buy everything up. Isn't that how it's worked? Well, pretty much. If you can control a man's wallet, you can control the man, and if you can control a nation's wallet, you can control the nation. If you can control the world's wallet, you control the world. I mean, money because is like in every single thing that we do. I mean, it's a very important absolutely. thing. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, it's a medium of exchange, and you need to distinguish between money and currency. Currency is money is a medium of exchange that has an intrinsic value. Of, that would be a silver dollar or a copper penny. But we have none of that anymore. Right. Currency is a note. Basically, it's an IOU. It says, I will pay you some point in time. But the problem with the fiat system is that it's indeterminate. There's no fixed value to the note that is handed out to you today. It, can, it will always lose its value through inflation as they continue to print more money. It, it, it's, it's the money tree that was in the... Um yeah, some classical fairy tale or something. It's the money tree. I mean, that's that's basically right. what it is. I mean, I wish I had, you know, a printing press. But um, uh, so, um, what what about um, civil liberties? Has that motivated you to run? Is that an issue that you hold near and dear, or it's absolutely? You know, we're gradually the erosion. I wrote uh, there's a book that I wrote several years back. This is 20 years ago, but it was called Philosophy in an Abstract World. And I was dealing with issues of philosophy, but chapter two has to do with political expediency in the lawmaking process and how, over time, they make little adjustments, little compensations to quell public outcry and to skim uh, immediate dangers to the people and to the pass laws that appear rational at the time, but after the danger is gone, those laws are never taken off the books. The Patriot Act is a good example today, yeah. where you have laws that were placed in effect to control terrorist-type activity, and, uh, you know, it, what's going to happen It's when, just when that title scared is all me. Long? When I first heard that title, Patriot Act, I just knew it was bad news. Well, I, that's Orwellian philosophy. It is. That's Orwellian Absolutely. theory, you know, uh, you know, evil is good, you know, <laughs> type thing. That's uh, oxymoronic phrases that they like to put. Well, what, what would you... 
what would the people have thought if this is, this is the act to take away all the rights of the people and slave our nation? That wouldn't have gone over very good. So you sugarcoat it, you give it a real fancy name, call it anybody, implying that anybody who is against this right. is not a patriot. Right, right, voting against okay. the Patriot Act. But so, you know what? That's They didn't call it the Constitution Act. They, they went to like a populist term like patriot, which George Washington um, warned us uh, against doing. And I'm looking at a quote here even. I, I don't know if you're a big fan of him, but uh, Teddy Roosevelt actually said, no man is justified in doing evil on the ground of expedience. Right, right. Well, so in, in this political expedience of what does is it, it leads to the gradual incremental erosion of liberty over time. This thing's been going on for a long time, since the First World War, Second World War mostly, and Vietnam, and as the people start to protest, and now you see it in, you know, the, the, the Patriot Act or, or the uh, National Defense Authorization Act. Yeah, it doesn't no matter if it's Bush or street, Obama. You know. Or this is what they were trying to do, was take you off the street, hold you indefinitely without trial and no right to appeal. Of course, federal courts recently struck that provision down and said no, you know, and Obama signed it and said, I'll never enforce it, right. but that doesn't mean that a future president couldn't enforce it. Didn't even he, though like, when he signed warn us he said, yeah, Obama warned us against signing statements, which is ironic. And uh, Right. He's <laughs> signing statement, he tells us that, he, well, I won't enforce this. He's a constitutional right. You know, scholar. that's not going to stop the next guy from coming in and using it. Well, the federal courts have likely, correctly, shot it down, said, no, you can't do that. Well, that sounds but like there are other things on there. Joseph there, Stalin would introduce, like, like to indefinite detention. I mean, that's right. right. Well, exactly. And this is where it's going. Um, you know, I was just out with... Uh, a friend at the park, and you know, there's three Chinook helicopters came in about 500 feet. Now, I've got this on tape over our heads, you know, tack ships with gun turrets out. And I'm this in some Indianapolis, in a public park, and drones. With swimming pool with kids. And I'm going, what is this, you know? And we can see it today. And that gives rise to people. People are not stupid, they can see what's happening. We are gradually moving into a military regime police state well, where that's if, because, you don't, if like, you don't agree with everything yeah. government says, you're the enemy of government, you're the enemy of the, whatever they want. And then you get movements like the Occupy movement is, mm-hmm. you know, coming out and then they pass laws to restrict protest and you can't hold a protest sign at certain, certain times and day or certain places and now they're restricting that, you know. I'm with you. There, freedom of speech abs- and freedom of assembly are guaranteed rights. They're even chiseling away at that, and we will eventually wake up to we're all just slaves of the state. Well, they're having free speech zones. I mean, I thought free speech zone was anywhere that is like sovereign land of the United States. Well, and- Ruth Bader Ginsburg said that the Constitution of the United States applies on every square foot of American soil. Uh, and she she comes up with some good things once in a while. I <laughs> agree with everything she says, but. She did say that, and she's right, you know. It, it applies everywhere, and you can't just segregate people out and say, yeah, you can you can speak as long as you stand over here out of the way and do that so nobody can see you, well, but it's, they're doing it. It's the contractors because, um, like, they're, like, you know, slowly trying to pull out of Iraq. Now they just need to sell, like, all those extra drones and, and equipment that they have, and they're selling it to, like, our local you know, law enforcement places, and, uh... Right, and right, and how does that jive with the right of the people to keep in their arms to protect themselves from tyrannical government out of control? Because that's why that was in there, Second Amendment, it's not, not to shoot turkeys and, <laughs> and deer. I mean, even though hunting was a major thing, right. they put that in there to stop the red coats. Yes. To stop red... Basically, that's what was happening during the American Revolution is that the Redcoats were out of control. they just bust your door down, come in, take your daughter out, and have their way with her, and barbecue your pig on the lawn, and say, oh, we're the king's men, and you can't do anything about it. It's called sovereign immunity. Right, you and, have a right to defend yourself and not, like, go through humiliation like that. And obviously it was, like, the First Amendment wasn't written for the governments, right? So, I mean, it's obviously written for the people. I mean, you can argue the military wouldn't need a Second Amendment, would they? Because they're the military, we expect them to have guns. But So it's, without a doubt, written for the citizens. To protect themselves from government out of control. when go- And they all do. Every government in the history of the world 
eventually has gotten out of control and turned on its own people and started to brutalize its own people. This has gone on since the Mesopotamian Empire. Right, but we're the sleeping it's, giant. So, like, you know, you don't, like, we're slow to anger, but, um, you know, that's what um, I think one of the uh, Japanese, like, generals said during World War II. Like, everyone there has guns. You know, you don't want to attack America. And, um, and that's right. I mean, every, you know, there's probably, um, you know, probably 100 million people that do, at least. Oh, it, yeah, at least. I mean, it was, I just got an email from a friend of mine was telling us how many weapons owners there are in the United States. And that's good. I mean, it keeps, it's designed to keep government in check and to prevent government from getting out of control and brutalizing its own people. Yeah, and a lot of them are like, you know, I mean, there are a lot of good cops and ex-military that um, also believe in the Second Amendment. In fact, some of them are the staunchest believers. So, I mean... Um, that's yeah there there is that um potential if someone breaks into someone's house without a search warrant or whatever that they're going to get return fire and um and that's the way it should be i mean if you invade someone's space like that and you know that's one thing about like house raids and stuff i mean wouldn't it be just more humane if they just surrounded the place and said we're you're surrounded and just wait them yeah. out for like right. even even if it takes a whole week wouldn't that be more humane Right, if you would think so. Well, we just passed a law here in Indiana that says that a person can to defend themselves against a police officer yeah, with, I deadly, with deadly force if the officer enters the house without a warrant. So that has passed here, and we now have that on the books. Hey, uh, congratulations. Uh, that's a, um, was that initiative referendum, or how did that pass? No, we don't have initiative referendum. We, we do have some critical thinkers here in the state. I mean, it's, it's not their... There are some people who are trying, and it's mostly uh, what they call in political science a responsivism uh, reaction. Responsivism is where they basically start responding to pressure from their constituents who are saying, hey, look, you've got to change this, and this is wrong, and if you don't, we're going to vote you out of office. So it's also called co-opting the ideas of your opponents, you know, where I, I don't care. And that's well, the biggest weapon we have. What I say, okay, go ahead and take, steal these thoughts. Did you ever read Abby Hoffman, steal these books? Yeah. You know, he's telling people, I say steal these ideas, okay? I'll give them to you. I don't really care at this point. I mean, yeah, it'd Absolutely. be nice, but it, yeah. you know, the, I have always said that is not the person, you have two different types of leaders in the world. You have the de facto leader and the de jure leader. De jure is the guy that's elected to represent you, but de facto leaders are like, Gandhi and Martin Luther King and you know what it, it, if I can't understand you know, if the people the of people Indiana that, it's the guy yeah, that everybody listens to you. and does what Sorry. he is saying and adopts these ideas as their own and moves forward that's a de facto leader so you can be an effective de facto leader without being elected to anything oh yeah like Benjamin Franklin um, was like kind of like that or Martin Luther King yeah. or Ralph Nader sure. or, although he did run for some stuff but uh yeah, absolutely. Um, John Lennon, you know, um, and lots of different people. Yeah. So I'm just doing it in a, di a kind of a different way, getting a different, getting at least a platform so I can get up and debate these issues with my opponents and make them discuss things that they will not talk about on their own. Well, I think you can win. I think you can win, that. Jack. I think you can win. I mean, I, it's 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 you're far more probably you, you know thoughtful, introspective than, than either of the other two candidates. Um, or, you, you know, the, the Republicans and the Demlicans. And um, I, I can't see how, like, if people saw you in a debate, they, they would be, I don't understand. Why Why don't, what, what's it, is this the year where we're going to have, like, a wave of independents and third-party candidates? Like, um, you, you know, maybe about, maybe 50 this year. Do you think that's possible? Is I would love it. I would love to see some new thought, creative thought, independent thought come in. Uh, people who are not in the hip pocket of the giant corporations and the Wall Street banksters and brokers who are running our nation into the ground because that's what they're doing. They're just basically going to, they're corporate raiders and they're raiding the United States and that's what corporate raiders do. They go in, they'll take the corporation, they'll take it over, they run it into the ground and then they sell out the assets for scrap metal. Well, that's what they're doing in the United States, the same thing. Well, we're not done yet on because, massive scale. yeah, if we can get this message out, I mean, I don't know about the presidency. That might be a, a tougher uh, game there. But you know what? In all across the country, in districts, in, in, in for senator um, like that you're running for, for Indiana, um, there there's enough choices. We do have enough independents and third parties where if people um, decide to get up and, and uh, 
and, and make a difference, um, it, it's possible. I mean, it, it's certainly so possible. In Indiana, we have a problem with ballot access. The, the ballot access laws in Indiana are extremely um, restrictive on how, how, who gets their name on the ballot, okay? And I have to collect 34, 36,000 signatures, but by the time they disqualify half of them, which they disqualified a whole bunch of them that we brought in because they said that we didn't use the right form. We used last year's form instead of this new and improved form, which has no substantive difference in it other than the date that's on the form. It's, it's identical. And they said, well, that's not the right form number. So, you, you know, those signatures are all disqualified. But these are Republicans and Democrats. But when you have Republicans and Democrats sitting in judgment of themselves, don't be surprised if they don't write the laws to promote their own self-interest at the expense of everyone else. That's exactly what they do. They don't want to this is, this well, they is, want to keep everything just as it is. Yeah, this is what they do. I mean, they... They, they cowardly vote for the Patriot Act um, because they're scared to be called unpatriotic. They pass a um, Medicare prescription bill where you can't even negotiate for prices. And then they bail out all these um, big uh, companies that were too big to fail, which um, hurt um, small mid and sm small size businesses, which might have bought up some of these banks. And then they pass the NDAA, um, some more bailouts. Um, and, uh, you know, they're invading our privacy, creating a police state. I, I mean, that's what they do and they you know they're introducing bills like SOPA and PIPA I mean that's what they do I'm not surprised by anything that they do I mean I, I, people have got to wake up I mean they have a 9% approval rating instead of not showing up I mean people you, you know they're not going to care they have no shame if they had like these like 1% turnouts they, you know they would walk proudly because of that well, we have a dilemma, too, which is the campaign, campaign finance and the way that things and like, things like uh, Citizens United ruling that allows my opponents or supporters of my opponents, which would be the 1%, the, the giant corporations, to spend infinite amount of money opposing Jack Rooney and what he says, okay? Because I'm talking a line that is not going to sit very well with him. And they can do that. I'm just a guy here in Indiana. I take that a, as a compliment. I'm not a rich guy. But I can stand up and say no to them and say this is wrong and you need to get your house in order or the people are, are going to change it eventually. They're yeah. going to do it. So I have to go up against it. One of my opponents, well, Luger had $4 million bucks in the bank. Uh, Murdoch had another two, and the Democrats have a million. I think my, if you go to the FEC uh, or it's, it's the Senate.gov, which I file with the, with the United States Senate, Secretary of the Senate, my financial reports and all of my... I spent only seventeen thousand dollars, you know. So, and I got enough votes. <laughs> their votes cost them like thirty bucks a piece. Mine cost like six fifty cents, less than that. If you divided it out by the number of votes I got versus the number of votes they got, what I did was far more uh, economic than what they're what they're doing. Well, do you but, do you still need more signatures? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, I have to have everything in by July 2nd, July 2nd. Uh, all the signatures, and they'd have to download the CAN-19 form from my website and send it to me before, or send it to the county right. uh, now, voter registration office. July and the 2nd voter registration. is Monday. Like, um, now, what yeah, you so. need to do is visit jackrooney.net and get all your friends and neighbors and everyone you can, just person walking the dog down the street and say, you know, would he sign this so we have another choice um, for, uh, uh, you know, Senate? Um, or, um, now, people could donate. Like, how much um, yes. does it cost to get on the ballot if you had to pay? I mean, is there... Is oh, that, you can't do that. You it's can't not allowed that. in You Indiana. have to get no. the petition. So, yeah. Yeah, no. But they can still donate, and then that would give us the ability to do race. Because if I don't get all the signatures that I need, which is a lot... Um, I just go directly to a write-in vote and then do a right. Uh, a, oh, okay. A public awareness. So you can do the write-in. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah, but then there are, there are technicalities involved in that because they always challenge the vote, and then the the person who challenges it, I have to prove that the signatures are valid. They don't have to prove that they're invalid. They I have to prove that they're valid, which is totally proving your, you have to prove your innocence here, you know. <laughs> right. That's how, how they stood it on its head. And that can cost me anywhere close to half a million dollars just to have the signatures of the write-in vote uh, on November 6th verified. 
Well, it's less expensive. Because the Republicans and yeah. Democrats will always challenge it. They just do it as a matter of course. Well, I'll tell you this. It's so less you expensive. You have to have a half a million dollars to go in and have the signatures all verified because you have to pay for that. Yeah. I have to pay for that. Now, if people donate, I mean, they should consider that it would be less expensive than any more bailouts or the direction that we're going, right? Um, I would think so. You're going to pay for it if we don't stop it. You're, they're going to get the money out of you one way or another. If we keep going down the road that we're going, every child born today has over half a million dollars in debt before he takes his first breath of life. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's the problem with the debt system: fifteen trillion dollars in debt right now. Only three hundred and eighty million people in the country. You just do the math, okay? And this, what, what this does, is it basically enslaves your children to pay off a debt that they had nothing to do with creating. And that's ethically, morally wrong. That's slavery. It's called indentured servitude. You're forcing a person to pay off debt that they didn't create. Yes, that's, you know, the, the sins of the father it's carry moral. on to that's the right. son. Yeah. I mean, how would you like it if all your debts had to go to your children? You'd think, you'd think twice about running that much debt, wouldn't you? Yeah, if you it, knew that your children were going to be responsible for paying off your debts? It's, it, that has always been considered a tort wrong. It has always yeah. been considered a wrong. Oh, that's that's uh, why we don't allow it. Once the person sense. is deceased, their debts are cleared out of their estate, and their children are not responsible for paying off any of the debts of the father. Yeah, that's well, a, sh there's no disagreement there. I, I mean, I don't see how anyone could disagree with that. We're handing this thing off to a future generations, and we just keep kicking the can down the road, as they say. And it's never, it's not going to be fixed. This will never fix it. What's going to happen is you print the fiat currency out to, until the value of the dollar is just so worthless, just like they did in the Weimar Republic before Hitler took over. They had printed the mark out to nothing. It was toilet paper. You might as well just throw it. They were using it to light fires in their stove because no one would accept it as a medium of exchange. And the same thing happened to the Soviet Union when it collapsed in the 90s. When it, so, there was no Soviet Union. They yeah, have printed people, it out so much yeah. by, with the Cold War trying to keep up with us yeah, that d no one would accept the ruble anymore. Germany, before the, um, uh, before, like, um, you know, the Nazis came to power, they, they were actually kind of a, you know, before the flood of um, people exiting there, like Einstein and people like that, they were kind of considered like one of the, um, like, well-to-do countries, kind of like a, uh, you, you know, like a um, civilized, artistic, um, had a lot of philosophy and, and science and, and universities and things like that. I mean, they were considered a very democratic and free country. And um, so it's, they just totally, their money went out of value, well, was, spiraled, and yeah, there's and been like 20 other countries. That's, that's an interesting uh, point. It had to do with the First World War, okay, and the uh, Treaty of Versailles and the reparations that were paid, and they, how were they ever going to get out from under it? So all they did is they just printed money. <laughs> they printed it, said, okay, you know, we owe you, you know, so many marks, we'll just print them and, and give them to you, and that's what they did. It doesn't but what work. what they didn't realize is that watered down the value of all the currency of their own citizens to the point to where it was worthless, and finally it got to the point where no one would accept it as a medium of exchange, and their markets all collapsed. Yeah, I have to admit, I've, well, I've thought about, like, you know, wouldn't that be possible? I mean, I've had, you know, I've questioned that theory and been like, oh, I wonder if that would work, but it really doesn't. I mean, it, it's no, so flawed. It does. It's been yeah. tried over and over in many societies, and it never works. So, and but, that's exactly what the road we're going down now. But we would and rather we live it. on our feet you than, than die it. on our knees, right? We'd rather live on our feet than die on our knees, and that's why you're um, speaking out and, and you want to give people a uh, have a real choice and inspire others. And um, so, how about let's just go through a couple of um, quick issues here, and then you know, just if you don't mind, just and just get your uh, you know uh, opinions on these. Right. Yeah. All right, how about um, the individual mandate, which um, actually the Supreme Court upheld today? Okay, well, the Supreme Court has upheld things, and, you know, Citizens United would be a good example. I mean, they're not always getting things right, but it was not at all surprising. But the problem with it, that whole package, okay, is the health care bill, how should it be paid for? And my whole thing is by... By repealing the whole thing and starting over with a better approach to the whole problem, 
I, I respect the Democrat status the issue, but it's not a regulator, regulatory or control issue. It's an education tied to a simple supply and demand economics problem. The quality and the cost of medical services uh, can be reduced by graduating more doctors and nurses from the medical schools. More doctors means more competition in the marketplace and for, for uh, medical professionals, which would increase the quality of service and lower cost. If you've got one guy with a bushel of apples standing in the marketplace and everybody wants apples, he can get a pretty good price for his apples because he's the only guy selling it, okay? If what? you bring 10 more vendors in there with bushels of apples and the supply stays the same, then the price of apples, what happens to it? Well, haven't countries tried price controls before? No, this is not price control. This is natural supply and demand economics. You well, I mean, the, the price Obamacare. You increase, the, yeah. you increase the supply. If you increase the supply of doctors and nurses and men and women of science through the universities, the United States has been graduating the same rate of doctors and nurses as it has for the last 40 years. Not nurses has increased a little bit. But we're falling behind in the sciences, we're falling behind in, in academics and some of these other nations. You look at them and they don't have these problems because there's a supply of doctors and nurses in those countries to meet the demand. So the whole problem can be solved by increasing educational spending for doctors and nurses. I think anybody that has a bachelor's degree should be allowed to go to medical school if they want to. Right now, the American Medical Association, and they say, you and thou shalt not speak ill of the American Medical Association, but I think somebody has to say something, is a monopoly over the practice of medicine. Yeah. And they do it under this benign premise that we're doing the public good. You know, we're protecting the public from the quacks. And I understand that. I understand there are good reasons why you should regulate it, but if you start over-regulating it, it raises the cost exponentially. Well, More here's a thought. Here's an idea. Of it. I think that would work. Let me know if you think this would work. I mean, it, it doesn't violate any um, voluntary principles. It, 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 it's just that you would organize it through the government, a public option that would be a catastrophic option, and um, it would have, like, maybe a $500 deductible or something, and so then you can have a medical savings account for that. And... Um, but it would be totally voluntary. It's an option. It's not a mandate. And, um, and, and whatever it costs, it costs whatever it costs to run the thing. And um, so if, if it costs a certain amount to run it, but you would save money without CEO pay and advertising and some overhead and being able to buy in bulk and stuff like that. So, I mean, do you think um, something like that would be a solution? or It would, but it would not reduce the overall cost of medicine, uh, medical services, okay? To reduce the overall cost of medical services, you must create more doctors and nurses and men and women of science uh, and, and, and educate them so that they can compete in the marketplace. The more people there are to compete in the marketplace, the lower the cost. Right, the right, and have market, competition, right? right um, the more, right. Yeah. That would solve that. So if you have a coronary today, you know, most people don't have a quarter of a million dollars for a triple bypass. Right, and, uh, and should you have to... around in there. Could, should right. people be able to like go to any doctor they want? Like, should, would do, like would they have to be bound by different certifications and stuff? I mean, they of course yeah, they would I, want well, to have that. Well, I agree that. with AMA on that point. You should have given. You don't want a guy who's not qualified to do brain surgery operating on your brain if he has, doesn't have the proper education training. But I'm talking about an MD. But you might be able to let some nurses do some things. Um, that yeah, that'd be another thing. Well, they have the nurse practitioner thing now, so. That's a step in the right direction, but I, they still won't let them write general prescriptions and do the things that MDs do. And that the only reason for that is they don't want and never have wanted the nurses being in competition with the medical doctors who are, they for, for some reason, they think that these things, no matter how long you work in nursing, you can never really graduate into an MD status. And I think that needs to be changed. Because there's some of these nurses, good ones out there, who are just as bright and just as intelligent and know just as much from experience as any MD out there. Yeah. Right, right. Now, that would be a good solution. Um, and uh, and some people, like, um, might not want to get insurance. Like, they might just want to have catastrophic insurance, which the Obamacare doesn't allow, but it also allows a lot of exemptions for, for uh, you know, some of its uh, friends um, that have contributed to them, I'm sure. And, um, but... Um, the uh, the insurance, like you might be um, 
principally opposed, I mean, this might not be a big issue to a lot of people, but you might be principally opposed to getting vaccines, let's say. But let's say the insurance company says in order for you to keep coverage, you have to get that vaccine. Uh, mandatory vaccination? Well, be, be, well, because, yeah, because um, the insurance is mandatory. Um, if you don't buy it, um, you know, you get okay. a fine. So are you asking me, am I opposed well, to it? Are you opposed it? to get that? Yeah. I'd have to give it more thought. I really okay. thought about the issue of mandatory vaccines, but I don't think a person should be required to do anything against their will well, by government. Well, here's the thing. I mean, their body. But it, I think that it would be the prudent thing to do to get vaccines. And, of course, there are a lot of people out there that think that if you take, you know, certain vaccine, it is, you, you end up getting the disease. But that was a result of, like, the polio vaccine, you know, where they use contaminated uh, uh, culture. And people ended up getting polio from the vaccine. Well, here's the <laughs> argument about that, though, because anyone who's taken the vaccine wouldn't be affected by the person who didn't. I mean, so I, I mean, so it shouldn't, you know, worry anyone who's already taken the vaccine if they felt like that's what they wanted to do because they're already vaccinated. Right. Well, personally, I get as many as uh, I mean, I've. I've had all my vaccines, so I have no problem right. with taking it. I know it's but not like said, a big issue of who are, for a lot of people. Yeah. But for some people find it an issue. So, um, and there are some people who will get allergic reactions to it and they're afraid. But and then they have the, the sinus one now too. Where, yeah, instead of the shot, you can get the sinus one now too, which is right. supposedly a little bit safer. And um, well, what about sunset clause laws? Do you think that's a good idea to? Uh, well, I think in matters, any matter that relates to the civil liberties of the people should always be sundown or sunset, whatever it is. It should expire after a certain period of time, because this is what we were talking about in the erosion of liberty. These things get passed through Congress. There's no sunset clause. At, like, you take a thing like 9-11 that came in, as tragic as it is, tragic as it was, and with deference to the victims of that tragedy, it did not change the Constitution of the United States, okay? Uh, not trying, saying that to be cruel, I'm just saying as a matter of fact. The, as they continue to go in there and try and take, in order to respond to the perceived threat that this was going to happen again and they were going to do other things, they started passing the draconian rules that infringed upon the rights of all of us. And I think any time they do that, it should only be for a very short period of time because what's happened is that there's, if there's no sundown clause in there, they just stay on the books forever. And after the emergency has passed, you're still stuck with bad law or law that is no longer necessary. Absolutely. I think that's reasonable. It's rational. It's, um, you, you know, wise, um, prudent. Um, that's just thoughtful and, and civilized to have a law like that. And um, uh, what about trade policy? Um, you know, there's different views on trade. What do you think about trade, sir? Well, I mean, what they're doing to the United States is just busting down the industry and putting it on trains and planes and hauling it out of here. So that is a very complicated issue that involves uh, labor, it involves um, ca access to capital, and it involves access to resources, that, which we have, but there's some things that are happening in the United States that are starting to cause the industrial base of the nation to crumble, and it's not being replaced fast enough by techno high technology uh, areas of, of industry that might replace it, or service industries that might replace it, and we end up with a very large unemployment, uh, unemployed population, which is right now probably about 25% of the country has no job. Well, I would it, say it, like a... 10, 10%, yeah. but the actual numbers are higher because they don't oh, count yeah. people who, who, who just said, forget it, I can't get a job, what's the point, and they drop out of the market completely. Yeah, they don't use and, the same methods that they did in, even in the 80s. I mean, they changed the way they measure the unemployment. Yes, it's been manipulated several times. So you, you really have to kind of do the math yourself, run your own analysis, which we uh, I do most of the time, and I'm coming up with about 25% unemployment rate right now. Yeah, I've seen similar studies, because, actually. You can just Google people, that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's another thing. There's two parts of this economy that most people don't understand. Same thing goes on in China. You've got the official economy, and then you've got the underground economy. These are people who work under the radar, under the table, they're working for cash, they're just barely getting by, I mean, and those people, even though they're generating income for themselves, 
and buying goods and services for themselves and their families, they're not counted in the economic numbers because they're basically invisible. Do you think a sales and, tax, like a fair tax, would be a good thing? I think the fair tax is a great idea. I think awesome. that that was yeah. the only way to really get us out from under the Federal Reserve because the Internal Revenue Service is a branch, sub-branch of Federal Reserve Bank. I totally and, agree with you. The fair tax would be like a, it would be like just a, a spring overloading of business and capital. I mean, if we were the only country in the world that didn't have an income tax and we just had one sales tax, I mean, you have to get, you can't have 999. You have to just only have the fair tax and that's it. Um, and uh, you know how many businesses? We'd have an immigration problem of businesses coming in here. Yeah. I mean, businesses be flocking in here. They'd be flocking in here, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, it's, uh, but uh, it wouldn't be a problem. It would be a great thing. Um, and Just a consumption-based tax, fair tax, you know, it's invisible. You don't have to fill out no 1040s at the end of the year. See, that's another thing is that oh, yeah. whole Internal Revenue Service system is so intrusive into privacy issues. You know, why? You know, my, they say, well, you got to report how much this employer this is a this is government getting involved as a middleman between you and uh, your your the person that you're partnered with in, in an employment situation, and you know I, it's just you shouldn't fear the government. You should you shouldn't fear your own government. Um, and uh, it, it, it's supposed to work for the people. It's supposed to be a good thing, and um, and that's what you're fighting for. That's uh, and 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 doing it. Um, eloquently and, and, and have a good grasp on all these issues, um, you know. So uh, what about um, a, a different subject here, um, NASA? Do, do, do you think um, we should fund NASA and explore um, our solar system and stuff like that? Sure, I think that we should. I don't. I think, you know, a lot of good has come out of the science, science and everything. There are benefits from those kind of programs that inure to the whole of society. And, you know, transistors and, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, different uh, microchips and things it came out of the NASA program. A lot of them did in aerospace. And the more we understand about our universe and the, uh, about our world and our universe, the better we understand ourselves. So, yeah, I'm for it. Yeah, they should, like, um, just, you know, let the whole private, like, when they discover new things, um, and they just should, like, hand it over to the private sector and, and let them, you know, make stuff out of it. And um, uh, what about... Um, uh, well, the, the Second Amendment. I, I actually, we already talked about that. I'm sorry. And um, what about? Here's a different issue. Um, just want to get your opinion on it. Industrial hemp. Oh well, we were just talking about that today, as a matter of fact, and why it, why it was illegalized in the first place. I don't believe government has any authority in the Constitution or anywhere else to regulate that industry at all, uh, except perhaps under the com under the Commerce Clause. But, uh, no, uh, industrial hemp, uh, uh, that's what they used in the beginning. We were one of the biggest growers of industrial, <laughs> or of industrial hemp during the, the uh, American Revolution. We, they were, our founders were hemp growers. That's yeah, what they did. We import and it was $400 million dollars most, of it mostly. each year. And, yeah, each year we import four hundred over $400 million of it from other countries. Sure. And we've got it illegal here, and you've got to wonder who's making money off of its being illegal, you know. That all that does is drive the price up. As soon as you create an artificial scarcity of the product, what happens? Same thing that happens with the bushel of apples. You, you only got one guy selling apples, you're going to get the big Oh, and talking about apple. apple, that's funny because iPhone specifically, I think Steve Jobs said, you, you know, that's, um, they, they, they create a false scarcity for the Apple's um, iPhones, and, and, mm -hmm. and that's how they get the prices. I mean, you see people standing, like, down the street for those iPhones, you know, and yeah. uh, it's an old trick. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's what I'm talking about. It goes back to Smith, supply and demand. You, you, you want to, you know, they create an artificial scarcity for the hemp, and then it, they, it drives the price up to whoever it is that's selling it to us. They can get better price because there's no competition. They've eliminated all the other people in the marketplace selling Apple. Yeah, while we're fixing everything else up and bringing back um, our Bill of Rights, we might as well make that legal and, and then get the fair tax. I mean, you, you know, if people really want a way out and, and, and possibly want another renaissance and above, I mean, it's just, um, 
you know, just hearing these kind of solutions and just imagining, I mean, I'm just imagining it right now, if there was a fair tax, I mean, it's just such a weight lifted off my shoulders just thinking about that. And uh, and if we're doing all these things correctly um, and uh, abiding by the Constitution, I mean, it could be such a, a nice place to, um, to, to you know, build upon and stuff like that. Um, well, uh, what about, um, let's see here, uh, well, um, well, I guess before I ask, there's two final questions, but do you have um, any, you know, issues that uh, we didn't um, touch upon tonight? There are many, many issues, and we, what we need to do is all sit down and come together and see there are many thoughts uh, that need to be brought out and many minds to change, and I think if we all work together as Americans uh, for a common good, we can do that but people are just going to have to wake up soon because this thing is not going to self-correct. Yeah, we need a new, new normal, Absolutely. in other words. Um, like, uh, and uh, you know, it's kind of funny. I was looking on YouTube at old, I think it was Harding um, clips, and he was proposing a new normal after World War I. Um, and, uh, and so, but anyways, um, it's... Uh, yeah, no, my dad, this is your government. It does not, it belongs to you. It does not belong to any giant group cartel of giant corporations or group of international bankers. It belongs to you. And if you want to change it, you can do that. Yeah, it, it really is something that, um, you know, because isn't lost. at the end lost. of the day, when you walk into that voting booth, you are equal to Warren Buffett and Bill Joe. Gates and Steve Jobs. Okay, doesn't matter who you are. Your vote makes you equal to all of those guys, and you're equal to Jamie Dimon on that day, <laughs> on election day. So it's up to you. Absolutely. Uh, well, um, let's see here. Do you have a past? You know, just kind of a fun question here. Um, like a past favorite president or politician? Well, see, I like, I like uh, Lincoln, of course. Uh, Washington, obviously, for obvious reasons, he was an independent, so he right. didn't want any political parties in there. So I put him up probably first. Say, hey, let's go with what George said. And then I liked Lincoln, and then, but I also liked uh, Eisenhower because he was courageous enough to say, to stand up and say, beware of the military-industrial complex. Absolutely. Now, the, the acquisition of unwarranted power, sought or unsought, poses a danger to our nation, I'm paraphrasing, poses a danger to our nation that needs to be watched. That was his and farewell address. Here. Yeah, right. you can look that up on Google. Um, it has Dwight, just type in Dwight Eisenhower's farewell address. And um, you know, the military industrial complex should not be confused with the United States military, the right. soldiers, okay? They take their orders from President of the United States, from we the people, at least theoretically. But when the military industrial complex, which is the giant corporations that rise up around the, the military to provide support services, weapons of war, WMDs, guns and tanks and rockets, launchers, those things can get have an influence over government because the way they work uh, within government to manipulate the electoral process. Oh, who gets in power? Who gets, who gets in power so that they can give the contracts to the people running the military industrial complex? And that would, of course, be the international bankers who finance them. And it's not okay. fair to their competitors either. George Washington also gave a farewell speech warning about the, the military also as well um, to generals. So that's, you know, coming from people that were military. Um, uh, well, Eisenhower, and then, of course, I like Kennedy, too. And, uh, but, look, you know, look what happens to those guys. I mean, it, half of the people I mentioned that were fascinating. Well, Eisenhower had two terms, and uh, and um, and Kennedy, you know, had bravery, and so did uh, Robert Kennedy. And uh, so, um, you know, there's a lot of us here, and we, it, it's, you know, a lot of people have have unfortunately shed their blood for these rights, and um, and that's why, you know, it, it's it's a serious thing. Um, these are. Life and I mean, this is about life and death, and uh, how right. we want to. We're live. adults. We have to talk about these things. If we don't talk about them as adults, they will end up destroying. Yeah, them. you can ignore politics again, but politics won't ignore you. You know, not at all. So. You're right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it's good and uh, optimistic to talk to you today. I hope. Um, you know, let's set some fireworks and, and get some signatures, and then 
I uh, just, you know, have, you know, a good choice for somebody to articulate all these issues from foreign policy to the, uh, you know, monetary systems um, and uh, civil liberties and just uh, issues that you're not going to hear from the Republicans and the Democrats. And, um, well, Jack, I, everyone needs to visit jackrooney.net. Uh, um, and, Jack, is there any other, uh, I, you know, forms of contact or, or things like that that uh, we sh should know about? Well, everything's explained on the website. And, and, and you know, if they want to the write to you, Indiana, um, yeah. are, are you know very intelligent people, and we're very hopeful that they're we're going to be able to get out and get to them. Spreading the message is, of course, difficult, but a lot of people. I'm I'm amazed at the amount of support that we've been getting because it's surprising, but not really surprising. People are ready. The time is right uh, for the kind of change. You know, while people were in the grips of hope and change, I was wanting. Where is it? You know. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> where did it, where is it? Yeah. And well, it's coming November 6, 2012. Um, if, if we can show our priorities here and show what's really important, um, I mean, this is... Well, that's what we're hoping for the people of Indiana. We're hoping, you know, they're intelligent people. This is a wonderful state. Yeah, let's it's occupy the uh, Congress. Absolutely. Yeah. Occupy the Congress great. and elect someone um, in there, you know? Yeah. It has great resources and everything going on, and uh, we're, we're hoping that we can we can reach enough people to see if we can get something in there now, um, in the United States Senate so we can make some change on the level that we're talking about because most of the things that we're talking about here have to originate in the Senate really ever to, to ever get anywhere because you're talking about macroeconomic issues you're talking about international treaties you're talking about things that senators do only yeah. senator can negotiate international treaties yeah, if we get a couple senators in there, I, I mean, some more senators. I mean, there's Bernie Sanders, there's um, Rand Paul, and, and then, you know, there's one or two other people on the, on the West yeah, Coast, I think. And, and exactly. Uh, this is the point that we'd like to make is that uh, people don't understand, well, what, it, what would be the effect of a Jack Rooney in the United States Senate as an independent? Well, when you have a Senate that is divided as this one is, like 51-49, one more independent can shift the balance of power. Absolutely. I mean, when, and hopefully we get like maybe two or three senators, and uh, and then maybe two or three uh, senators yeah. and shift the balance of power. And if there are people who are thinking along the lines that we're all thinking here, our friends in the libertarian movement and the independent movement, our all of our friends in the third parties, and the way there there is a general consensus among all of them, no matter where they come from, that there's some things that are terribly wrong right now that need to be straightened out. I believe and if so. we can get three, two or three people in there, then it's no longer a Republican-controlled Senate or a Democrat-controlled Senate. It's a Senate that has a balancing point with the independents, so that now come to us and let's discuss things. Yeah, you just need to get no the ball rolling. You no longer have the ability to yeah. shove things down the people's throat. And that's what they've been doing. They don't even read the bills. And, uh, no, they don't. It's, um, Half the time they don't. They don't write them. They don't read them. They're just submitted by some... Uh, person who is a lobbyist who gives them the bill and says, here's the money, get this, get this through. And that's what they do. Yeah, we, we need to get, uh, you know, as passionate about this as we do about, um, you know, sports that we watch and stuff like that. I mean, because um, this is um, a lot more important. And uh, it, it this is uh, pretty exciting. Um, I mean, I'm excited, and I hope that your listeners will be as excited as I am about the potential for our future that we have if we all work together to make it happen. Because it will not happen on its own. We have to do it. It's just a we simple thing. It. Yeah, it's just a simple thing. Just vote um, and participate. You don't have to be in Indiana. I mean, you're going to be running for no, federal anywhere. office. I mean, yeah. I, so I, I'm calling you from Florida, and I'm enthused about this campaign. Um, and uh, it, it, But I know that when you're up there in the, in the Senate, you would be representing, you know, me too, you know, you know? so um, I'm glad Indiana has so well, if you have any like friends this. in Indiana, you give them my card, <laughs> okay? Absolutely. We'd yeah. love to talk to them. Well, I'll say goodbye to you um, after this interview, Jack. Um, thank you uh, so much, and I appreciate your time, and um, so, uh, uh, you, you know, um, break their legs. <laughs> thank you so much for talking to me, Thomas. You have a nice day. Thanks, sir.